The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Jennifer Schaus coming to you live from Washington, D.C. as we continue and finish up our first week of government contracting webinars. Uh, today is Friday, and we are joined by Danielle Carr, who is going to present on subcontracting and risk mitigation, uh, obviously a very important topic in government contracting. Uh, we do have seven weeks of webinars um, start to finish. We wrap up on the 15th of September. Um, the full schedule is on our website. All of the webinars are recorded. And in the event that you need to jump off early or if there's a topic that you want to, uh, to see that you're not able to attend, uh, just check back on our website for the recordings. Uh, we have done these over the past several years. so. Our library currently ho holds, I think it's about 30 or 40 uh, webinars. Uh, at the end of these seven weeks, we'll be doubling that, uh, that library list. Again, they are all complimentary, uh, and you're uh, more than welcome to download uh, any of those on the site. Uh, a little bit about us, uh, based in downtown Washington, D.C., providing various services for government contractors ranging from uh, 8A uh, certification, uh, capability statements, GSA schedules, proposal writing, contract admin, business development. Uh, we also host some networking events and seminars throughout the year. Uh, we're doing one in uh, November on doing business with DOD and the Intel community. Uh, if you're signed up for our newsletter, you'll be um, uh, alerted to the dates, times, and locations for those. Uh, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, you certainly can do so on our website. Uh, it's a complimentary uh, newsletter. Um, we also have an event section where information on events and seminars um, are posted. Uh, a little bit about me um, on this slide, but more importantly, I'd rather um, use our time wisely here and share some information about Danielle Carr, who again is uh, covering the topic of subcontracts and risk mitigation. So Danielle, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your knowledge and insight. Um, and I will let you uh, dig into your presentation. And thanks to all the attendees for joining us. Okay, thank you, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Carr. I am a Acquisitions Pro Program Manager for Washington Headquarters Services. I do work as a consultant, so outside of my client site work, I also mentor small businesses um, regarding compliance, um, CPSR reviews, um, I do a lot of checklists for them as far as matrices, um, procurement actions, and I also do business development. I do a lot of training on subcontracts and risk mitigation, so I want to touch on a few points within the few minutes that we're allowed. And if you have any questions as far as anything you want me to elaborate on, you know, please contact me or Jennifer by email or by phone. Um, you can go ahead to the first slide so we can start. Next slide. So I picked a quote um, that you know pretty much um, says what subcontracts and risk mitigation is. I mean, it's by J. A. White. Every aspect of business carries some degree of risk. One of your key responsibilities as a subcontract management professional is managing these risks to avoid situations that might jeopardize a firm's operations. Risk can be anticipated and controlled in areas such as financial, legal, quality, and performance. My hope is that throughout the presentation in the next few minutes, you walk away and are able to apply some of these mitigation strategies to your agency, your small business, or your large business. Um, subcontracts is really a big deal, and most people don't realize it, but actually 60 to 80 percent of all federal acquisition dollars are spent with subcontractors. Um, the majority of the activities that occur, you know, at the subcontract level are pretty much everywhere, public, private, commercial, large, medium, small, and foreign companies. Next slide. As the work increases, you know, with the government, their insight decreases. So subcontracting, it does present a lot of risk, you know, when you look at the government. Not only do they need to focus on a prime, but they really need to have, you know, privacy and with the subcontractors, but because of, you know, the, the, the contract is only with the prime, they don't have that. And as you get 
into more subs, not just the tier one and tier two, but they're also tier three subs. You know, the problems, they, you know, sometimes can get out of control. So you need to have, you know, plans put in place to make sure that everyone's concerns, all the parties involved, you know, are, are very well protected. Next slide. As you can see, you know, I have this, this picture. It says the U.S. government, the prime, the subcontractor. So your relationship, it starts with the government and the prime. But most contracts, it says that the prime is like the only one allowed to talk to the government. So the subcontractor pretty much doesn't have a say in a lot of things that, that can go on. You know, the, the government slows down their terms and it gets to the prime. The prime slows it down for the subcontractors. And you have the subcontractor like, hey, you know, what's going on? And you can can I can I see um the actual contract so that I can know what I am negotiating? Go to the next slide. And here I listed, you know, some points regarding, you know, a lot of the risk with the government. You know, there is typically no legal privity of contracts between the US government and subcontractors. That that's a pretty big deal. The prime contract establishes processes by which the U.S. government can control and manage subcontractors. They put things in place, for instance, like say if there's, you have an award that's over 750000 that large business is supposed to develop a subcontracting plan. And when you bring on those subcontractors, you're supposed to get advance notification or prior consent to bring on additional subcontractors. There are also mandatory um, prime contract slowdowns. I won't go into many of them, but let's say, for instance, your contract is over $750,000. Then you're going to get into TINA, which is the Truth and Negotiations Act, where you're supposed to disclose certain things about your subcontractors and yourself as a client to the government. And also, under FAR Part 44, you know, that's another topic on the 18th, but then you get into contract and purchasing system review. Go to the next slide. And the prime's concerns as far as subcontracting, the prime is held financially accountable, you know, for the subcontractor. They have to also deal with a lot of complex government oversight. Um, they have to deal with, you know, the sub lack of timely reporting of costs on cost reimbursement contracts, and that's a pretty big concern. Or, you know, if the sub performance isn't doing very well. You know, that's the prime space out there on the, on that client site. And if the subcontractor isn't, isn't performing up to par, there needs to be a type of mitigation plan put in place to correct that. Let's go to the next slide. And then these are some of the subcontractor concerns adhering to the prime way, even if the sub has more experience. That's always a pretty big deal. Or the sub's past performance is not usually reported in the, in the government reporting system because when the government is doing CPARs, like I said before, the relationship is only with the prime. So they're basically reporting on that prime contract of performance. And then the sub has to deal with price, cost, and delivery pressures by the prime. So my way of doing things is to always try to find a win-win strategy um, for everyone, let's go down to the next slide. Go to the next slide. So here are some of the reasons why the government, you know, does have a major need for oversight. Um, one is to provide the customer, that's usually their requirements office, with timely best value solution to a requirement, to maintain public trust in the government acquisition system, to implement public policy, to protect the government's best interest, to assure contract performance, which is one of the most important which is probably one of the most important pieces um, 
of subcontracting. And here are some ways to alleviate the, those many concerns, which is to um, properly manage your subcontractors through their creation of, you know, a work breakdown structure, which would be the subset of the prime work breakdown structure. Um, and if you focus a lot on project management, this wouldn't be something complicated to, you know, develop, design, implement, and execute. Um, part of it is a lot of, you know, dealing with communication. And here I call it a using interface control documentation, ICD. You know, a communication of requirements, achievement of requirements, baseline documentation that folds through the program and to all team members. Let's go to the next slide. In the DOD space, um, we do a lot of Q quality assurance. And basically the quality assurance is, you know, inspection, you know, performed by the United States government to determine whether contractors afford the contract obligation. We mo we're monitoring contractor performance through meetings, reports, and inspection. We're pretty much developing a surveillance plan that sets forth the methods and frequency you hold meetings, require reports, and conduct inspections. Let's go to the next slide. And this would be a cost, a quality assurance surveillance plan. I kind of put in, you know, a sample, you know, of a matrix that you could use. You know, it has, you know, your contract title, your subcontractor POC, and it has about seven, um, you know, questions that you will want to complete. Let's go down to the next slide. This is pretty much the same thing. It's just an outline that you will follow, you know, your work, your master work breakdown structure, your elements assigned to the subcontractor, the schedule, your deliverables, acceptance, the risk management plan, inspection, meetings, reports, documentation, and close out. You can take from this, you know, develop your own, you know, whatever, you know, fits the situation that you are in. Let's go down to the next slide. And these are just some of the examples I chose to, you know, use professional services, um, you know, some of the, the, the risk and concerns that they have. And there are seven, there are seven major sources of risk for professional services. The government's difficulty in determining its requirements, selecting the right type of contract, overly optimistic delivery schedules, poor quality of services, lack of project management, multi-sector workforce challenges, inadequate acceptance criteria. Let's go to the next slide. And here are just a few ways to mitigate those risks found in professional services contracts. We want to establish an integrated project team, develop a performance work statement or signal objectives, conduct very, very thorough market research, you know, use commercial quality standards and metrics, create contract incentives, you know, for you know fast performance or they're exceeding. On your expectations, you want to develop a quality assurance plan, you implement some project management, and tie pay to performance results. Go to the next slide. And I always like to tell subcontractors, you know, really, really be mindful of boilerplate slowdowns. There, there is a list of slowdowns that are mandatory. You know, I didn't include them, but if you would like to, you know, have that list, I'm more than willing to send it to you. A lot of the risks that are involved is, is basically when a novice subcontract administrator, you know, handles these transactions. And many prime contractors, you know, they tend to include a generic list of slowdowns. You know, they just do, do a deep dive and the subcontract is like, what's going on? You know, I don't have access. Can I see, you know, the contract so I can actually know what I'm negotiating? And I like to say, if this is not applicable, do not agree to it. If you have not seen the prime contract, how do you know that it is accurate? And especially when it comes to, you know, cash flow down, because a lot of large business, they have to adhere to a lot of the cost accounting standards and, they, and they're just flowing it down to the subcontractor. But if you are a small business concern, 
you are totally exempt from a cash flow down. And that's something really important that I like to, you know, point out. There is a list of other exemptions for cash in FAR Part 30 and also FAR Part 8.103.2. Let's go to the next slide. Clauses that I would say, you know, pay a lot of attention to would be limitation of liability, you know, price charge, or any price changes, Identification, your scope and goals, liquidated damages, payment, data protection and security, service level and warranty. Let's go to the next slide. Overall best practices is always I'm going to advocate to educate your staff. The more knowledge that your staff and you as the provider for your company has, the better you'll be able to mitigate a lot of the risk. You know, have a plan, have a plan in place when you are even thinking about entering that contract. You know, have a statement of work or PWS consistent with the prime contract work breakdown structure. Whatever, you know, the prime is getting from the government, you would want to have something similar to that. Be very selective of your flow down clauses. You know, develop, you know, a clause. You know, document your meeting, your report, and your inspection of your deliverables. You know, treat subcontractors as part of the team because they are. They are very critical, you know, part, you know, of the infrastructure and the work moving forward. Use a compliance matrix at the prime level. Do the same, you know, for subcontractors. I might have several examples of a compliance matrix anyone on the call is interested in seeing one, I'd be more than willing to, you know, forward that to you. And also, again, do not fall into a trap of flowing down everything. Let's go to the next slide. Here are just some tools and resources that I wanted to list. Um, the National Contract Management Association launched the Subcontract Management Training Forum in 2015. Um, the Subcontract Management Institute, they developed the subcontract body of knowledge. It's pretty similar to the SIMBOC, which is the Contract Management Body of Knowledge, but this is geared for all the standards um, for the subcontract management professional and subcontracting. Also, the National Defense Industrial Association, NDIA, has a FAR flow down guide, and I included the link, um, as well as the Uniform Commercial Code, because when you're doing like court to court, um, subcontracting, a lot of the FAR doesn't really apply. Um, you can pull a lot of the clauses, you know, from the link at cornell.edu that I um, entered into this slide. Um, let's go on to the next slide. And that pretty much is the end of the presentation today. If anyone has any questions, you can feel free to contact me at 240. 784-7418 or at the car at ifast-llc.com. Danielle, thanks so much for presenting today and sharing your knowledge on subcontracts and risk mitigation. A lot of great uh, resources there and good uh, information as far as what uh, contractors should do, both at the prime and subcontracting level. And you've got uh, Danielle's contact information there. Um, we hope that you will join us next week, which is the second of seven weeks of uh, government contracting webinars. Next week, we're covering cybersecurity, bid protest, grant writing, proposal writing, and pipeline, filling your pipeline. Uh, all of the webinars are complimentary and listed on our website under the webinar section. Any questions, we ask that you please direct them directly to Danielle. Thanks again, everybody.